Welcome to Pathway, we're so glad you're with us today. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. We invite you to fill out a digital connect card on the PCC at Home app or pccfw.tv or text the word connect to the Pathway text number. To all of you who have continued to give support financially during this time, we wanna say thank you. We're so grateful and we want you to know that from online worship to Pathway groups to community outreach, your generosity has made ministry possible. If you'd like to give, there are several ways you can do that. There are give buttons on our website at pccfw.tv and on the PCC at Home mobile app. You can also text the word GIVE to our text number, or you can mail a check to the PCC office. For all the latest COVID-related updates, be sure to visit our website. Just click the red banner at the top of the page to view new announcements and find quick links for Kid City Online, content for students, adults, and more. You can also access all of this through the COVID link on the PCC at Home app. As always, our services will continue to air at pccfw.tv, so if your health is vulnerable, we hope you'll continue to be part of our online community. Thanks again for choosing to show up here. your extra hour sleep in, didn't you? Yeah, you're all looking good this morning. Hey, uh, we are in this series called Heart Matters. We're just going to tug at your heart over these next few few weeks and uh, deal with some a little bit of some heartstring issues that I think are good for all of us to really look at and, and get our arms around. Next week, if you're new to us at Pathway, if you've not been here in the past year, you're brand new, every year we set aside a Sunday, which we call True Vine Sunday. True Vine is our ministry that, uh, that we launched years ago to families who are moving towards adoption, those who are, who are uh, investing in the, to, to foster care and ways in which we come around and support those families as well. And it's a big deal for us as a church. And next week, you're not going to miss it. Bishop Aaron Blake is going to be with us from Texas. And, uh, and it's just going to be an amazing, amazing story what their, their little church did uh, for their entire city. But also, I think it's going to challenge us as well as it relates to our heart towards those who desperately need to, uh, to feel the love of a father and a mother uh, in a way that, uh, that I think only Christ followers can truly do. So this morning, I want to talk to you about, uh, about your money. And don't worry, I'm not asking for anything. Don't get nervous. Don't grab your purse. Don't run out the door. Just kind of hang on to it for a little bit. A uh, number of years ago, there was a book that was re- released just simply called what is, what is Life Worth? It was written by Ken Feinberg. Ken is a, is a lawyer in in New York, and actually the book uh, ended up becoming a movie that's just simply called Worth, and, uh, and I found myself intrigued and, and just fo- focused in on that movie through my break, spent an evening watching it, and then going back, and you know how it is, you, you watch a movie that's based on true story, so I always go back and I want to know how true is the story, because sometimes you can watch a true story based on a horse, and all you find out is that one day some boy had a horse, but it had nothing to do with the movie whatsoever. Well, so this and I went back. I wanted to dig into it a little bit, and uh, it's very interesting. After 9/11 hit, the government got very nervous very quickly because they realized thousands of lives are lost, and uh, airplanes have gone down. And if we do not do something quickly, what can potentially happen is we'll have thousands of lawyers at our front door, thousands of victims looking for compensation. We'll have the airline industry that's going to be sued. And they really did. They stepped back and they said, if we don't get a handle on this, it will literally bankrupt our nation along with all of these other industries at the same time. And so they looked for a lawyer to come in and begin to develop what they called the 9-11 compensation plan. And uh, Ken Feinberg actually had been a part of some of these little dealings in the past. And he was obviously so moved by what was going on that he committed to giving all of his time pro bono. For 33 months, he worked on this plan not realizing really what all would be entailed and what all would come into this. But what he had to do coming out of the gates was he had to create a formula, a formula 
that simply was a formula based upon the economic, economic value of the person that was lost. In other words, does the CEO at the top of the Twin Towers, should his family receive more money than the person who's washing the dishes down below? I mean, all of this came into play. You know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to create this fund? And what they knew was this. They knew they needed to have 80% of the families impacted by 9-11 to sign on the dotted line and to accept the compensation plan in order for the nation not to go broke, not to have all these lawsuits come into play. And so Feinberg went after it. The one thing he said is, I don't want to be touched by the emotion of it all. I'm working on the formula. Well, stories had to begin to get heard. And as the formula began to get rolled out, there was one particular individual. His name is Charles Wolf. His wife was in the Twin Towers. She died in the Twin Towers. Actually, normally she would go to work at 9 a.m. in the morning. And that Monday, her boss came to her and said, I need you here at 8.30 from here on out. So on Thursday, if she would have normally come at 9, she would not have been lost in the Twin Towers. But because she had now come at 8.30, she was lost. Charles Wolf began to look at all that Ken, Ken Feinberg was doing and realized that there are all sorts of holes in this. And so he actually created another fund, another website, just simply said, fix the fund. And uh, as, the, as the deadline date was coming and Feinberg is seeing, we don't have 80%. We hardly have a few And what they began to realize is we have very few people that are actually tapping in and following our website, but Woof has thousands following his website on Fix the Fun. And so one day became this encounter. The reality is the encounter was, was, uh, and the frustration from Woof was not so much the issue of the fund, it was the issue of the families and the person that was lost. And so he meets with with Feinberg, and in the midst of this moment, it was a true moment, Uh, that happened is this understanding that we don't care about your formula. We want you to care about the person. All sorts of emotions tied to it. The emotion of sudden sudden tragic loss, the emotions of wondering how how will I go on without this person and how am I going to raise these kids alone? And then came the financial piece of how are we going to make ends meet and how will I cover the expenses? And the emotions attached to the fear, realizing from the sense of, the, of, our, of our nation's leaders, this could financially destroy our country and airline industry. It all centered around the issue of the heart. Jesus is deeply concerned for what is attached to your heart. He is. Matter of fact, in, in Mark chapter 12, we see this uh, throughout the Gospels. We see it actually come out of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Uh, Jesus asks the question about what is the greatest commandment, and, and he, 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 uh, he goes back to, to this moment in Deuteronomy 6 where it simply says, the Lord our God is, is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words, love him with all of your spiritual being. Love him deep within your soul. Make sure your soul is always in a good place. Love him with your mind, your intellect. Understand him. Get to know him. And and then certainly rely upon him to give you the strength you need, but also to love him with all of your heart. Because at the heart, the heart encompasses our passions and our desires and our affections and our emotions. And the truth is, we all have had our heartstrings pulled at some point or the other. Have you not? I mean, there's just certain images, matter of fact, that come to our mind. We have. Our, I mean, that does this not pull at your heartstrings? beautiful little baby like that. Does that not pull at your heartstrings? Of course it does. I had to give you this one. I'm trying to show some empathy towards those of you that love cats, trying to get, trying to get into this. Uh, if money's going great, we're, we're happy. If money's not going so great, we're not happy. So let me just ask you a few questions, because I want to talk about the emotions of it this morning is what I want to talk about. And, and uh, anybody, anybody, just to raise a hand, so see how honest this crowd is? Up in the venue, you do the same online. You can hit your little deal. Uh, hey, see, see how honest you are. Saturday night was actually very honest, I think, last night. How many of you have ever had stress over money? All right. Anybody lose any sleep over money? That's yeah, okay. Anybody ever have buyer's remorse? <laughs> oh, my goodness, yeah. Why did I do this? Any fear over money? Yeah, a few of you. Uh, there's frustration, anger, anxiety, relational fallout over money. Anybody? Yeah, sometimes maybe you feel out of control over money. Last Sunday, I sat down in the afternoon. I grabbed my computer. I began to go through all the bills for the past month. I thought, I need to make sure I need to figure this thing out. I got three kids in college right now. 
I got one kid who, who thinks she's an adult, so that's costing me. And, uh, and you know, and then, then I, I want to be a good steward of what God has given to me, and, and I, I, I feel that I am, and I want to invest well, and all that for the future. And, and I'm sitting down there, and I'm going through all these, and I'm writing down everything that we paid for last month, everything that we paid for, everything that I paid for last month. <laughs> And, uh, and I started getting a little tense about things. I felt like, i got to get control of this. Uh, but then sometimes some of us actually, because of how you have managed your, your finances so well, you have a sense of perspective attached to it and peace. There might be a little bit of joy and satisfaction and happiness and contentment. Maybe even a feeling of being grateful for all that God is doing to you. Well, the reason for that is this. The reason why you feel all those emotions relating to the issue of finances is because money is a revealer of really what is inside of us. It really is. Matter of fact, some of you this morning, some of you this morning, some of you are getting a little tense with me just bringing up the subject of money. Truth be told, typically, when I start, even when I've done a series in Pastor Money, usually on the first Sunday, there's usually someone that gets up in the middle of the message and they leave. And I'm thinking they're just going out for their kids. At least that's what I'm hoping is going on. But, 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 but it creates a little bit of tension. Listen, again, I'm not asking. I'm just simply talking. Because the big idea for you this morning as we wrestle through this is this. What truly has my heart? Or who truly has my heart? Is the other question. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, turn to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, we have an encounter that actually Matthew records for us and Luke records for us. And I have read this encounter on multiple occasions. This week, it was just such an eye-opener for me as I began to dig into this a little bit. And, and, uh, and it, really, it really touched my heart. It really spoke to my heart. It tugged at my emotions as I began to dig deeper and deeper and deeper into this. And this is what I love so much about Scripture, is that you can come back to, to a portion of Scripture time and time and time again. And it's almost as if every time you come back to it, it says something different to you. It speaks to something in your life that it hadn't spoken to before. And that's what happened with this particular encounter for me this past week. This is what happens. Jesus is obviously out teaching. And then it says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran to him, not kind of scurrying his way through, not a slow kind of trot, but ran to him, fell on his knees before him, and says, good teacher. And he, he followed Jesus. He knew Jesus was a rabbi. He he saw a lot of goodness in Jesus that he may have not have seen in others. That's what drew people to Jesus. He said, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's got an eternity question going on here. Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. It's almost as if he's, he does, the guy's not realizing. Do you realize who you're bowing in front of? You're right. You're bowing in front of the Son of God. And, and, uh, and the reality is that, that, that he's just kind of, he's there, and then Jesus, Jesus kind of begins to tug at the heartstrings of his heart. And he says, you know the commandments. You should not murder. You should not commit adultery. You should not steal. You should not give false testimony. You certainly didn't defraud anyone with all your business dealings, did you? Honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And then Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. If you have your Bibles open, and you've never underlined that phrase, underline that phrase, that Jesus looked at him and, and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, underline that word sad, because he had great wealth. And Jesus looked around, and he said to his disciples, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of of God, And then the conversation goes on about the very fact that you can't get a, a camel through the eye of a needle and, and all that goes with this. But, but anything. And then Jesus says, nothing is impossible with God is what he says. Basically, everyone can get there. Uh, Jesus, now listen, this is what I want you to understand in, in regards to this dialogue that is going on here with Jesus and this rich young guy. Jesus is not saying money is evil. Jesus is not condemning one for having wealth. Jesus is not saying you should settle, you should sell everything, and then settle for a life of poverty. I believe what Jesus is attempting to do is to help this rich young man, because the Gospels, the other two bring it out, this was a young guy, to help this rich young man see that what he was attached to, that what he attached his righteousness to, would not buy him into heaven or even provide fulfillment in this world. There, were, there was really several problems that were going on here in the midst of, of the heart of this man and, 
and just write these down and think about this. First is this, is that his heart was attached to what he had achieved. He was a rich, young ruler. And, and that is that, that certainly he would have known the law. Uh, he would have understood the law. He would have had a sense of, uh, within the context of community, great respect within the context of community. But yet at the same time, there were some issues that he was, some emotions that he was dealing with within his life. Even though he had all the money that, that, uh, that certainly would make anybody happy, he still had this sense of feeling insecure, unsatisfied, and uncertain is what he felt. He felt insecure, unsatisfied, and uncertain. I mean, think about this. You know, money is really an unreliable source for one's security. If you don't have enough, you have insecurity. If you have too much, you have insecurity. <laughs> Trust me. I mean, because you're wondering, what am I going to do if, it all, if the bottom drops out? Either way, either way, your finances have your focus. I have run into individuals that, that uh, obviously they don't, they don't have very much, and they, so they're dealing with this issue of how am I going to get by, and, and some of you are dealing with all sorts of challenges in your life as it relates to student loans, as, as it relates to your mortgages, as it relates to maybe some credit card debts and all that go with it, and you're wondering how am I going to ever make ends meet. You can get there. Trust me, I think, really believe you can get there. But then I've talked to others who they're on this pursuit to get more, play in the market every day. And one day, it's a good day, and the next day, it's a bad day. And, uh, and there's a sense of insecurity that takes place. Look at where you're at every day when you, when, you, when you go into your investments. Where am I at every day? Well, it's going to change tomorrow. Chances are it's going to change tomorrow. It's going to change next week. It could change, it could change just like that. But either way, your finances are focused. Unsatisfied. He could, you know, think about this. He could have anything that he wanted, and yet he knew that there was something still lacking. Jesus said, there's something you lack. There was something still lacking in his life. And he was uncertain. He realized, wait a minute, have I been good enough to have eternal life? I've been a pretty good person. And so, listen, the world says that money makes us valuable. And for some, their wealth is actually a reminder of responsibility and opportunity. You do that very well around here. You know, you, when, you know, I just, the sense of your generosity and the sense of how you, how you give and how you manage your money. I know of many of you that, that you realize this is given by God and I'm going to handle this with a sense of responsibility and with a sense of opportunity. For others, their wealth simply makes life more complicated. Uh, matter of fact, a few years ago, Zappos Apple CEO, Tony Heesh, who, uh, who certainly, um, as a young guy, took over, the, took over that company uh, ended up being worth about $840 million. And uh, he started working for Zappos. He only took $36,000 a year because he thought, I don't want to, you know, I've got enough money already. Uh, he sold his big mansion and he bought like an acre of land and he's put Airstream trailers on the acre. He lived in, a, he lived in an Airstream trailer. And then he invited all his other coders to come around and live in the trailer park with him, and just so he could have this sense of community. And uh, he continued to gain more and more and more wealth, but then something turned in Tony's life. He bought a big place in Utah. He would start actually paying people to come and live around him and to come to his parties and his events. And they would actually come and be a part of these events because he would pay them to come. He, he was trying to figure out where my friendships are at. And, and he was realizing, I've got it all, but there's something missing in my life. Matter of fact, he even made this statement. He said, I made a list of the happiest periods in my life, and I realized that none of them involved money. I realized that building stuff and being creative and inventive made me happy. Connecting with a friend or talking through the entire night until the sun rose made me happy. Trick-or-treating in the middle school with a group of my closest friends made me happy. Eating a baked potato after a swim meet made me happy. Pickles made me happy. But we all know that what happened to Tony is that don't, Tony died tragically in, in a house fire, in, 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 a, in his house fire. We, and they, they say it was, it was accidental and not, intention, not intentional, but he began to consume drugs and consume more and more alcohol, and he... Found him in a, he found himself in a place of deep loneliness. Insecure, unsatisfied, and uncertain. For the rich young ruler, he had achieved it all. 
And yet he was still lacking at something. And so what Jesus does here is Jesus opens up the window to this man's heart. And what he's going to try to do is this. He's going to try to show this man how to move his heart from indifference to really love is what he's going to do. So he also tags into his identity and realizing that his identity was in who he was. I mean, let's just kind of face it. When we read the story of this young man, the truth is he had great moral wealth. I mean, he tells Jesus, I, you know, he had great moral wealth. He was doing things right, uh, and he had great wealth. <laughs> As a matter of fact, because he had great wealth, all the religious of his day looked at him and realized God's blessing is upon this man because of his wealth. Obviously, his parents did something right, and he's been doing something right. There's not a sin issue in his life. Inheritance for eternity shouldn't even be a question in this guy's life because God is pleased with this man because of his wealth. Because of, of who he was, there was nothing he could not have, and there was nothing he could not do. I mean, he was the friend that had everything, is what he was, is what took place. And yet he says to Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Again, going back to the text, why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. In other words, I've acted always in justice and in kindness with my wealth. My parents taught me how to do this when I was just a wee little guy. And, and the fact is that I have, I have been a good boy. All my life I've been a good boy. Does the goodness not count? I, I, I've done enough funerals over the years, and I've met with enough families over the years. When I sit down with someone with a family and I begin to process what did they give their lives to, and then we move into the spiritual conversation, talk to me a little bit about what was happening in their lives spiritually. What was happening in his life? What was happening in our life spiritually? And especially if I don't know the person. And, and it's, it's not been uncommon to hear phrases like, he was such a good person. Banking on the goodness. He did so much good for others. Or if I'm, if I'm dealing with someone who is on their way, realizing that time on this earth is short, I'll hear, well, I've always done my best to do good in this world. And the problem with goodness is, what's good? And how much good is enough? What I find interesting about this dialogue with this man and Jesus is that Jesus asks him about the commandments that relate this way, but he doesn't deal with any of them this way. And this guy's got a question this way. Jesus hits him this way, and I don't know why, but for some reason the guy doesn't step back and say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, Rabbi. <laughs> Aren't you missing... I'm, I'm talking this way, not this way. What about this way? <laughs> he, he, doesn't, he doesn't even deal with that. And, and, and Jesus, Jesus, I don't know what that may, means, but Jesus is about to help him understand that it's not about doing good that secures your eternity. It's about something that you receive. But listen, you cannot receive it if your hands are attached to another Savior. So the third was this, and that was that his security was found in what he possessed. Or, I would even change this word to his Savior was found in what he possessed. The text says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. I've never noticed this until this week. Just hang on to the thought. Hang on to that. Bank that away in the back of your mind for just a moment. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will, treasure, you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Listen, he doesn't tell the man to sell everything he has and give it all to the poor. He says, sell everything you have and move from love to indifference. Open up your eyes to those who have been less fortunate. Begin to touch the poor. Begin to care for someone outside of yourself is what he's saying. 
And at this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad because he had great wealth. That word sad, it's the word grieved. It's used one other time in the New Testament. Matter of fact, Luke brings it out in Luke 22. When Jesus is in the garden and he's praying and he's sweating drops of blood, it's the, word, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the same word as the word anguished. In other words, Jesus was grieved. He was anguished over this reality that at some point soon, he was going to be disconnected to his father. And this man is realizing, goes away anguished because he had great wealth, because he realized that his savior was found and his security was found in what he possessed, and he couldn't give that up. You're asking me to give up my savior. You're asking me to give up what I'm attached to in this moment. He was owned by what he was attached to, which kept him from loving God with all of his heart and allowing God to truly change his heart. And Jesus was saying, listen, the solution to all this is you got to let go. <laughs> you got to let go. See, a Christ follower, when it comes to this issue of finance and money, I, I think they really live four ways. They live with a grateful heart because they realize it all comes from God. They, they, they live with a faithful heart, realizing that God will supply all of my needs, and so therefore I'm going, to, I'm going to organize and manage what God has given to me in such a way that I'm going to demonstrate my faithfulness to him, and I'm going to, to live within my means. I'm going to have some margin along the way. I'm going to try to figure all this out, but yet I'm going to realize, God, thank you so much for what you've given and, and, and how you've provided. They live with this generous heart. They are just generous kind of people and along the way with, with their resources, and there's a joy that's deep within them. Matter of fact, it really comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart to give, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, why do they live? Why does a Christ follower live with a grateful heart and with a faithful heart and a generous heart and a joyful heart? Because they understand what has been truly given to him, given to them. They understand that, that the ultimate gift is not simply, not the financial, it's, it's, the, it's what Jesus has given to me. It's what Jesus has provided for me. Matter of fact, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Jesus looked at him with love. Don't miss this. Just hang on to this. Think about this for just a moment. Close your eyes as I read this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Okay, you don't open up your eyes now. Did you see it? Did, did, did you get it? Jesus is saying, listen, there's no formula. The work that he did for you upon the cross, giving up all he had in heaven, coming down to take on the form of a servant, that for your sake he became poor, that every life is worth the same. No formula. You are all precious in his sight. So the solution is, let go of what? Maybe it's letting go of doing good things. Maybe letting go of control or independence or shame. Allowing others to come around you and help you in whatever it is that you're wrestling through. Maybe fear or anger. Maybe it is money. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's sex. Maybe it's singleness. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's some past pain. Maybe it's this deep feeling of condemnation. What is keeping you from truly letting go and receiving all that Christ has for you? When I was, uh, when I was doing this, um, getting ready to do this message and just spending my time digging through uh, commentaries and what others had to say. I uh, I came across um, uh, just a little bit of a um, of a thought that came through Tim Keller. Tim is I love Tim Keller, and and Tim actually writes about this event in the book of in with a, with a commentary that he put together on the book of Mark, and uh, I found it to be so um, meaningful to me that I wanted to share it with you this morning. And so, um, just let these words kind of speak into your heart this morning. He said, what is your attitude toward money? 
It's not a coincidence that for every one time Jesus warns about building our lives on sex and romance, he warns ten times about money. Money has always been one of the most common saviors. Your ability to go out to cool restaurants, to have a nice things, to negotiate a professional culture and, and peer group, all those things are probably more important to you than you know. How do you know that money isn't just money to you? Well, here are some signs. You can't give large amounts of it away. You get scared if you might have less than you're accustomed to having. You see people who are doing better than you, even though you might have worked harder or might be a better person, and it gets under your skin. And when that happens, you have one foot in the trap because then it's no longer just a tool, it's a scorecard, it's your essence, it's your identity. No matter how much money you have, though it's not intrinsically evil, it has incredible power to keep you from God. But did you notice what Mark wrote as Jesus talked with the rich young ruler? He looked at him and loved him. Why was Jesus' heart suddenly filled with love? Jesus was a loving man, of course, but this explicit statement of his tenderness toward a specific person is rare in gospel narratives. Did Jesus love him for his leadership potential? Was it because of what this man said? No, I, I don't think so. Jesus, who at this point is about 31 years old, looks at him and identifies with him. Jesus, too, is a rich, young man, far richer than this man can imagine. Jesus has lived in the incomprehensible glory, wealth, love, and joy of the Trinity for all of eternity. He has already left his, that wealth behind him. Paul says that through Jesus, though Jesus Christ was rich, for our sakes he became poor. And I'm going into, into a poverty deeper than anyone has ever known, Jesus says. I'm giving it all away. Why? For you. Now you give away everything to follow me. If I give away my big all to get you, can you give your little all to follow me? I won't ask you to do anything that I haven't already done. I'm the ultimate rich young ruler who has given away the ultimate wealth to get you. Now you need to give away yours to get me. And if you understand that Jesus is the true rich young ruler, it is going to change your attitude about money. For example, you won't be trying to figure out how much you have to give away. You'll try to figure out how much you can give away. The real standard for how generous you will be is the cross. Jesus is saying, I want your attitude toward your money to be utterly changed and reworked by what I'm going to do there. Does it move you to think of what Jesus did for you? When that begins to really move you, amaze you, make you weep, you'll have a fighting chance to, of avoiding the trap. Letting Jesus' sacrifice melt you will drain money of its importance for you. Human status becomes just human status. Approval just becomes approval. You can give money away and you can keep it, or you can keep it depending on what's the best thing at the time. The only way I know to counteract the power of money in your life is to see the ultimate rich young ruler who gave away everything to come after you, to rescue you, to love you. Jesus says, my power is always moving away from people who love money and power. My power is always moving toward people who are giving it away as I did. So where do you want to live? Where do you want to live? And so now I want you to think about what you're attached to. I want you to think about the emotions you're feeling toward money. I want you to think about all that you possess or even desire to possess someday. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. You will have treasure in heaven. Jesus was not saying it's wrong to have nice things. He's not saying it's wrong to have financial resources. He's not saying it's wrong to be rich. And in the world standards, we all are. He's saying, keep it all in perspective. And remember that no matter how rich in the world's eyes, you are still poor without receiving the work that Christ did for you upon the cross on Calvary. Listen, you can die rich and end up eternally without hope. You can die poor and end up eternally rich. Why? Because he who is rich gave it all up to become poor so that you could become rich. How do I have eternal life? It's not based on the good that I do. It's not based on how much money that I have. It's based upon receiving the grace that Christ extends to you because the good work that he did on the cross for each and every one of you. 
and it should change your heart. Jesus is about, he wants to transform your heart as it relates to every aspect of your life. So I didn't ask for anything. But I will ask you, what are you doing with the good work that Christ did for you on that cross? Are you receiving that? Because listen, again, no formula. We're all equal in God's eyes. And Christ gave his all for you and for me. We're going to take communion. And uh, if you came in this morning, you don't have the elements, uh, we want to tell you that in a few moments, there's some elements down here. Uh, the team is going to lead us, and they're going to kind of sing over us is what they're going to do. And I want you just to allow this song to sing over you this morning. And, uh, and if you need, you need elements, feel free to come up while the song is being sung and just grab some and go back to your seat. If you are new to us, um, we have open communion around here, and that is that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, you can take communion with all of us and receive it. And so what I'd like for you to do this morning is, uh, as the song is being sung, um, just go ahead and stay seated, and then once we're done, um, I'm going to come back up and, and we'll take communion together. stronger 
thank you. Thank you for um, the work that you did for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord, for demonstrating to us the, the equal value of worth that we all have in your eyes. That every person in this room, every person upstairs, every person online, precious in your sight. So this morning, we, we remember the price paid for our salvation. And we take this bread to remember the body that was given, and we eat in remembrance of you. The blood that was poured out. You said to those around, you say to us that it's the blood of a new covenant, it's not based upon what you do. It's based upon what you did for us and that you poured your blood out as that atoning sacrifice for our sins so we could be at one with you, Lord Jesus. We thank you. And so we drink in remembrance of you. And we love you. Let's stand together. Let's sing the last part of that chorus again. Can we do that? Let's just sing it really loud. Can you guys do that? Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of blood. Glory to Thank the Lord for the work He did in our lives as well. It's done so good. Good day. I just want to, before you leave, just a couple things. <clears throat> if uh, you're guest, stop by guest services on the way out. If you're looking for next steps, stop by next steps. For some of you, uh, having this little conversation might have stirred up some emotion in you as it relates to the fact that you just kind of feel a little out of control uh, as it relates to your finances. Every January, we do this twice a year, we offer a class called Financial Peace University, FPU. And, uh, and you can go to our website, you can stop by guest services, and they can give you some information on when those dates are or next steps. I would just encourage you, just go after that. Don't let that, don't let that control you. Don't let that, 
don't let that just uh, hold you back. I mean, really step back and realize, you know what? God has given it to me. I can, I can, there might be some seasons of tension, but I can walk through this with a grateful heart and with a faithful heart and with a generous heart uh, because, you know, I can manage it. I can manage it in a way that will just bring, will bring honor and glory to God. Some folks down front love to pray with you as well. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you later. Thank you again for worshiping with us today. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there are members of our church online team or our staff who would love to do that. Simply click on the live prayer button at pccfw.tv or click the conversation bubble on the PCC at Home app. We encourage you to continue your worship through giving. Just click the Give button on the web or the app or text the word GIVE. Finally, be sure to check the web or the app for the latest updates and at-home resources. We also share many updates through Facebook, Instagram, and our weekly e-news, so be sure to follow or subscribe. Have a great week, and we'll see you soon.